Welcome back, everyone. In chapter nine, we will be learning about hypothesis testing. But first, let's check out the learning outcomes for the chapter. In this video, we will first go through the conceptual content on formulating hypotheses for a single population mean, as well as understand the difference between type one and type two errors. Then in the next video, we will continue the 9.1 video and talk about how to formulate a decision rule for testing a hypothesis, focusing on the critical value and p-value methods. Then in the last video, we will learn how to formulate hypotheses for a single population proportion. So if you're ready, let's get started. Hypothesis testing is an application of statistical inference where we make a hypothesis or ask a question about the population and then use sample data to see if it's true or not. So in descriptive statistics, we take data and describe what's occurring, but with inferential statistics, we are using sample data to infer what's going on in the population. Since we can't study everything in the population, hypothesis testing is performed in many industries, such as manufacturing, food, and pharmaceuticals. It's a major part of business statistics and will be the primary focus for the rest of the course. Hypothesis testing helps business professionals have a way to make decisions about the population means, proportions, as well as compare different populations even though we don't have all of the information about the entire population. We're gonna focus on the approaches for single population means and proportions. In hypothesis testing, two hypotheses are formed, the null hypothesis denoted by H sub zero and the alternative hypothesis denoted by H sub A. Now the null hypothesis will always have the equality sign in it, whether it is equals, less than an equals or greater than an equals. Hypotheses are always stated in the terms of the population mean because we are hypothesizing what's going on in the population. Again, this is because we can't study the entire population, so we use samples to understand it. We do not write hypotheses about samples because we have all of the sample data, so you don't need to hypothesize. You would just analyze it like we do with descriptive statistics. When working with hypotheses, we assume that the null hypothesis is true. We will only reject it if the sample data gives us enough evidence to contradict it. Having enough evidence means that the null hypothesis is not true, and therefore the alternative hypothesis holds true. So there are three common reasons to test a hypothesis in business. The first is to test the status quo to see if everything is working fine or if something needs to be fixed. So for instance, Kellogg's cereal wants to make sure that its cereal boxes are filled with 16 ounces of cereal. If it feels too little, customers will be dissatisfied. If they overfill it, then we're giving away extra cereal for free. So here in red, the null hypothesis states the mean fill of cereal box is equal to 16 ounces. That means the machine is working. The alternative hypothesis states that the mean fill does not equal to 16 ounces, so something is wrong with the machine. Now, not equaling 16 ounces could mean that it's overfilling or underfilling. We don't necessarily know, just that the machine is not working as intended. Another purpose for hypothesis testing will be to test a research hypothesis. This is often related to new product development where the decision maker wants to demonstrate something to be true. So for instance, Goodyear wants to be able to declare that its tires will last longer than 60,000 miles on average. This would show to customers that the tires last a long time. So here in red, we see that the research hypothesis is the alternative hypothesis because Goodyear must find evidence to prove that this alternative is true. Whereas the null hypothesis states that Goodyear's tires last less than or equal to 60,000 miles. One way to think about the research hypothesis is if the alternative hypothesis is true and the tires last greater than 60,000 miles, it's a win for the new product. Sometimes companies want to test a claim. If the stated claim includes the equality in the story, it's going to be the null hypothesis. If it doesn't include the equality in the story, then it's going to be the alternative hypothesis. So for instance, here, 
we have a medical clinic that claims the wait time is less than 15 minutes. So less than 15 minutes is a statement that does not include the equality sign. Therefore, this is going to be the alternative hypothesis. The medical clinic is going to want to test if this claim is true. And this is relevant because we don't want people to wait too long in the clinic. Within hypothesis testing, there are a few types you'll commonly see. The first is a two-tailed test. This is a test where the null hypothesis will be rejected if the sample mean is much larger or much smaller than the hypothesized population mean. So recall in chapter eight, we learned about confidence intervals that focus on the lower and upper limits around a point estimate. With hypothesis testing, we're now focused on the outer tails where the sample mean is either larger or smaller. Therefore, we are now out and the tails are not within our confidence interval estimate. A one-tailed upper test is where we're testing to see if the null hypothesis will be rejected if the sample mean is much larger than our hypothesized population mean. So with a one-tailed upper test, we can see now that if the sample mean is much larger than the hypothesized population mean, it's going to be in the right tail over here. You could also be working with a one-tailed lower test where we're testing to see if the null hypothesis will be rejected if the sample mean is much smaller than the hypothesized population mean. So here we can see if the sample mean is much smaller than the hypothesized population mean, I'm going to be in this tail over here and we will reject the null. In other words, if we are somewhere in the white shaded areas of these shapes, we do not reject the null, meaning the null is true. If the sample data gives us enough evidence that we are way out in one of the other tails on either end in a two-tailed test, or in the upper right tail in a greater than test, or in the left-hand lower tail in a less than test, then the null is not true and the alternative hypothesis is true. Let's look at an example. The mayor of Oceanside claims that the mean or average time spent by people in metered parking spaces at the beach exceeds 33 minutes. Since the claim states exceeds 33 minutes, that implies greater than, and this will be our alternative hypothesis. So if we took a sample of 50 cars at the beach to test this hypothesis, and if it turns out that the average time for those 50 cars is much larger than our hypothesized mean of 33 minutes, then that means our sample mean is somewhere here in the upper tail. So we would reject the null since the evidence supports that the mayor's claim is true that people do park more than 33 minutes at the beach. What about a one-tailed lower test? Say the Department of Agriculture has stated that the average rainfall in California is at least 23 inches and we are not in a drought. We could use this hypothesis testing to determine if this is in fact true. So at least means that it includes 23 or more inches of rain. Recall that the null hypothesis must have the equal sign in it. So the statement belongs in the null hypothesis. So we take sample data of rain collected throughout the state and the sample mean is much lower. Let's say the sample mean is 20 inches of rain. So that is somewhere here in the lower tail. Then we reject the null and it turns out that we do have a drought year because the alternative hypothesis, which states the average rainfall is less than or 23 inches is true. For a two-tailed test, let's check out an example. The bottling company for Coca-Cola has its filling machine set to 12 ounces per bottle. Since we have equals to 12 ounces in the story, we know this will be the null hypothesis. In this case, Coca-Cola would be concerned if it's either underfilling or overfilling its bottles. So we take a sample of bottles and test how many ounces are in the bottles. If the sample mean is found to be much larger and the sample mean falls out here or much smaller and the sample mean falls over here, thus falling in either tail, we would reject the null and we would need to fix the machine. If the sample mean falls within the middle area, we would not reject the null and know that the machine is working fine. These distribution curves can be a very helpful way to visualize the sample mean against the hypothesized population mean and know if we should reject the null hypothesis or not. Here are the possible outcomes of hypothesis testing. Recall in chapter seven, we learned about sampling error where the sample is never going to be a perfect representation of the population parameter. 
So due to the potential of extreme sampling error, two possible errors can occur when a hypothesis is tested. We might have a type 1 error or a type 2 error. So in this table here, it shows the states of nature on the top. In other words, the null hypothesis could be true or the null hypothesis could be false. Here on the left, we have the decision based on the sample data that the business decision makers will choose. So the business decision makers would either not reject the null or reject the null. If the null hypothesis is true, but we reject the null, a type one error has been made. If the null hypothesis is false, but we do not reject the null, then we've made a type two error. In this class, we're gonna focus on type one errors, which is when the sample data leads us to reject the null when it is true. The decision maker controls or chooses the alpha level or how much error it's willing to accept. Whereas type two error, the sample data leads us to not reject the null when it is false. So an analogy might be a little helpful to understand type one and type two errors. So imagine the null hypothesis is that there is no fire in the house. And the alternative hypothesis is that there is a fire in the house. Now imagine the smoke alarm going off in your house, but there is no fire. In this situation, we have a type one error because the alarm is sounding an error, which is extremely annoying. This is considered a false positive because the smoke alarm somehow thought there was a fire, but there wasn't. Type two error is when there is a fire in the house, but the smoke alarm does not go off to warn us. This would be considered a false negative because we think everything is fine, well, even though it is not. Many statisticians argue that you should never use the phrase, accept the null hypothesis. Instead, we will say we do not reject the null hypothesis. Thus, the only two hypothesis testing decisions would be either reject or not reject because we recognize that there's a chance that there might be an error. That's why with jury verdicts, the juries will always say not guilty rather than innocent because the person may not be actually innocent. The same is true with hypothesis testing. Just because the sample data does not lead us to rejecting the null hypothesis, that doesn't mean the null hypothesis is true. So in other words, this is one way to protect yourself where you recognize that there's a chance for error and you're highlighting the fact that the sample data is where you are making the decision from and there's a chance that it might be wrong. In the next video, we will walk through the different approaches for hypothesis testing and how to conduct the test.